Last week, we finished discussing the ups and downs of Season 3, the first Turkey Day, and the various quote-unquote filmmakers whose work gave way to thousands of riffs. In this chapter, we're going to discuss Season 4, the track record of Hercules on film, the initial steps toward producing a mystery science theater movie, and the creative and personal crises that it brought on. I'm Ryan Rodriguez, and this is Season 1 of The Coolness Chronicles, the history and legacy of MST3K. Chapter 5, Passive-Aggressive, Minnesota Nice Season 3, the first to air on the technically newly formed Comedy Central, ended its 24-episode run on January 25, 1992. The show would start airing its fourth season in June of that same year, but for the sake of perspective, this chapter begins the following month. July 10, 1992. Time for Mystery Science Theater Alive. This was a full-blown live production of the show, with the cast appearing in character, riffing a movie in a theater packed with fans. It was done as an experiment, no pun intended, to test the waters for a possible tour. Based on the reaction of the live audience, it dawned on creator Joel Hodgson, producer Jim Mallon, and the rest of the cast and crew that it seemed that the show worked exponentially better depending on the volume of people watching together. Naturally, they started discussing possibly making a motion picture version of, of MST3K. The good news? The movie eventually got made, albeit in a very compromised version. So I guess it's not good news so much as lukewarm news. But the truly bad news? This little decision irrevocably destroyed the creative relationship between Joel and Jim, and it led to season 4 being the last season to feature Joel as the full-time host of the show. In the years between the show ending its initial run and its revival, Joel has maintained that he never intended to be the host for the entire run of the show, as he was getting more uncomfortable on camera. We'll eventually get to his ideas for a new host in due time, but it's important to note that while he always felt that he would step down as host, he fully intended to still remain with the show in the same creative capacity he always had, but that ended up not happening. To be totally fair regarding this eventual parting of ways, because I wasn't there and I don't know any of these gentlemen personally, I'll present both perspectives on the issue, taken from a recent Wired oral history of the show. Joel's take. I was fighting with Jim Mallon. We had decided, oh, let's be like Star Trek The Next Generation and do a movie. Instead of 22 movies a year, we'll do one really good and be rich and famous. And that's when Jim said, okay, well, I'm the producer and I'm the director. And I just felt like that didn't acknowledge my position. I'm like, I created this. Where's my acknowledgement? I felt that that was kind of a power grab on his part. We were an ensemble. We did everything as a group. So that's when I kind of said, if you direct this, I'm leaving. And it just all fell apart after that. Jim's recollection. I think Joel operated under the idea that this was his show and everyone was working for him. And everyone else who was in this sort of cooperative mode, that it's all of us working together. So it would be somewhat analogous to John Cleese saying, Oh, by the way, this is my show and you guys work for me. The rest of the Pythons would probably have taken exception to that. Basically, we got to this conclusion that whatever Joel thought the show was at the beginning, it now didn't function that way. And so Joel had a choice of what he wanted to do about it, and ultimately, he chose to leave the show. Amongst Misty's, it seems that Joel's version of what transpired between he and Jim is the only one supported, and given that many of the key MST3K architects eventually detailed their various frustrations with Jim, it feels pretty corroborated. I'm not here to shit on Jim Mallon, mainly because I feel he contributed quite a lot to the show and its legacy, but those frustrations do paint a picture, and it's certainly not a positive-looking one. That said, behind the scenes, Season 4 was not an entirely negative experience. The season gave way to the arrival of the amazing Mary Jo Peel in the writer's room. A native Minnesotan, Mary Jo had been performing stand-up since 1987 in addition to working for a local temp agency. This part of her career, which I can personally relate to, is detailed in her excellent 2011 book, Employee of the Month and Other Big Deals, which we'll get to much later. 
During her time on the stand-up circuit, she befriended many of her future MST3K co-writers, especially Bridget Jones and head writer Mike Nelson, and started writing for the show full-time in the fourth experiment of the season, the infamous Teenagers from Outer Space, which we'll also get to very soon. In addition to serving on the writing staff until the end of the show, Mary Jo quickly established an on-camera presence as well. Kinda. She actually first appeared in a voiceover-only appearance, but it was a biggie. Halfway through Season 4, she took over the role of Magic Voice, the disembodied, omniscient presence on the SOL that usually gives the countdown to commercial sign during each episode's prologue. Later on, she would appear in cameos during host segments, notably as Jan in the Pan, a living, decapitated head that starred in The Brain That Wouldn't Die, and, most importantly, Pearl Forrester, Dr. Clayton Forrester's hate-filled, disapproving mother. She even took over as the main mad during the Sci-Fi Channel run, in addition to succeeding Frank Conniff as film screener. But, as always, I'm getting way ahead of myself. As for the key four cast members of the show, this was certainly a year of accomplishment. Joel is particularly great this season. His riffing is much more refined, and his acting during the host segments is at its peak. This is especially odd when you consider how increasingly uncomfortable he was on camera. He's still occasionally laughing during takes and having difficulty memorizing lines, though, as you can occasionally hear Kevin or Trace in character as Crow and Servo whispering his next line or putting an emphasis on their delivery for his next cue. Or maybe he's reading his lines off a card as if he's reading them for the first time. It's an energy that feels truly spontaneous and it's actually quite charming and definitely separates him from the measured, rehearsed Mike who brought a professionalism that pretty much defines his tenure. Also at this point, the characters of Crow and Servo are pretty much locked down, as are the performances of Trace Beaulieu and Kevin Murphy, and Crow's surprisingly effective eye movement is constantly a focus, which is again one of my favorite things about the show. Sidebar, I acknowledge again, that's very weird. Also, Kevin is much more comfortable in the theater, firmly establishing his versatility that will only grow with the show. Jim Mallon has also locked in Gypsy's voice and personality, and that too will grow. Growing! Because a linear deconstruction of season 4 would be completely boring out of my mouth, I've broken up the 24 episodes into a few chunks. First, we'll discuss the last three Film Ventures International episodes, which you'll recall from our discussion in the previous chapter, then turn the focus to two filmmakers who each supplied two movies from Mockery this season, Ray Kellogg and Bird Eye Gordon. After that, we'll discuss Manhunt in Space and its baffling sequel, Crash of the Moons, segue into a rather research-heavy chronicle on the importance of Hercules to the series, as well as Hercules' history in motion pictures, and conclude with a run called Deepest Hurting, where we'll discuss every other episode in the run, from the aforementioned teenagers from outer space to the zenith of punishment, Manos the Hands of Fate. Although I'm saddened that, after this season, no more movies from Film Ventures International, or FVI if your kink is abbreviating, were featured on the show, I'm delighted that their last quote-unquote contributions to the show come complete with some of the best inside stories of MST3K, from Dennis Miller being a complete pissant, to Kim Cattrall sending Crow T. Robot a bouquet of flowers. Let's start at the beginning with the season premiere, Space Travelers, a very literal retitling of the 1969 John Sturges film Marooned, which stars Gene Hackman and Gregory Peck, and was nominated for three Academy Awards, winning one for Best Visual Effects, making it the only movie to receive the MST3K treatment to do so. Iron Man, this is Houston. Iron Man, this is Houston. Do you read? Go, Houston. Do you affirm retrofire? Negative. Say again. I said we had negative retrofire. Bailey, kill it. And if that big baby doesn't fire this time, they're not coming back. For the FBI treatment, the movie's credit sequence is replaced with the classic substandard computer-generated titles, but instead of placing this ugly text over footage of another unrelated movie, it's just looped footage of what looks like a globe spinning in slow motion but it's so over-processed and blurry that you cannot make out the texture of the globe, so they could have just used a blue dodgeball and gotten the same effect. Production value. FVI at its best. As a movie, Marooned, 
uh, I mean Space Travelers, is not a bad movie per se. It's just a really, really dull one. The plot is something that could be easily made into a riveting drama. Astronauts are stuck in space on a malfunctioning spacecraft, slowly approaching death by lack of oxygen as supporting characters on the ground decide whether or not to risk saving them. The problem, again, is that it's just so fucking dull. Even with Gene Hackman and Gregory Peck, the appearance of whom gives Trace ample reasons to bust out his spot-on Peck impression, doing pretty solid work, it just drags. If you've ever seen Ridley Scott's The Martian, just imagine that all the soul was sucked out. Then you would have marooned. But there's a stigma that has dogged this particular episode to this very day. Since it's not really terrible per se, does it deserve the MST3K treatment? I honestly don't know. I can say that I've watched it three or four times and will definitely watch it several more times before I die, and then I enjoy it every single time. My favorite moment does come quite early in the episode, and it's not exactly a killer joke, but it always makes me laugh. You see, Maroon's director was John Sturges, the man who directed masterpieces like Bad Day at Black Rock, The Magnificent Seven, and The Great Escape, all films that we will discuss at a later date. And when his credit appears on screen, though, there's a genuine moment of remorse from Crow, as if he's not happy that he's gotten to the point where he's riffing a John Sturges movie. John, you've done better. Whether the movie is suitable for riffing or not may still be up for grabs, but one thing is entirely certain. Dennis Miller is an asshole. And I know you're telling yourself, hey, Ryan, we already knew that. But you probably didn't hear about it from the pen of Kevin Murphy. Kevin, never one to mince words, took the opportunity to tell a little behind-the-scenes story in the 1996 episode guide. And, well, it might be my favorite thing in the entire book. Here is a dramatic reading in its entirety. Not long after the show aired, a few of us were in Hollywood. Our friend Nick Bacay was working on the exciting new Dennis Miller show on Fox, invited us to see a taping, and actually meet Dennis afterward. This would be a thrill. We already knew through Nick that Dennis was a fan. Wow! So we excitedly watched the taping. It was really, really not good. It was very bad. In fact, boy oh boy did it suck out loud. The guests were boring, the sketches were slow and unenergetic, Dennis's monologue was tired and humorless, but I figured Dennis was in a little slump. Maybe he'd read all those bad reviews of his show in the papers, so he was feeling down. We wouldn't say anything but great things when, about the show when we met him. Nick brought us into Dennis's office. A short while later, Dennis himself came in. He was a wreck. Gaunt, pale, looking like Keith Richards in the junkie days before he'd fly off to Switzerland to have all his blood replaced. Dennis mumbled something about us slipping because we had done Marooned on our show and it was a pretty good movie and maybe we'd lost our touch. In a word, he slammed us. Then he just sat there, sweating, staring at us blankly, and we smiled and stared back. Then it was time to go. That's my Dennis Miller story. Ultimately, Dennis got a new show on HBO and beat us out for an Emmy. Twice. He deserves it, poor guy, for all he's been through. Game, set, match. Other sports metaphors. Zing. The next FVI stinker is the third experiment of the season, City Limits. What is City Limits about? Well, I've seen it numerous times and still don't have a great hold on that. I know that it takes place in the future and it has James Earl Jones in it. And there's nudity. Apparently when FVI sold the movie to syndicators, they didn't bother to blur out female nudity during a bathing scene, so Joel takes a moment for a solid visual gag and breaks out an umbrella covering up the naughty bits and retracting the umbrella when the scene is over. But that plot? Here's the trailer. Maybe it can enlighten me. At the beginning of the next century, 15 years after the Great Plague swept the earth and left a world of orphans. Where are you going? I'm going to the city. What for? Because I want to be a clipper. There's no such thing as a clipper. Yeah, there is. A young adventurer goes in search of a legendary band of teenage warriors. <laughs> Clippers. He finds a city filled with young survivors who have rejected the chaos of the plague and made a new world with new rules. Rule number one. No more killing. But all this is about to be shattered. Wow. By a group of outsiders. A power-seeking corporation that embraces fear. 
and violates the laws forbidding guns. Progress is a train. You can climb aboard. You can get out of the way. Or you can be crushed. This train isn't stopping. Nope. None of that rings a bell. But I'm grateful this movie exists for one very important reason. The movie features Kim Cattrall prominently, and Crow, as any young bot is wont to do, falls passionately in love. So much so, that he dedicates an entire host segment to her, and he forces Joel, Servo, and Gypsy to reenact the scene from Mannequin with him, after he delivers a song straight from the heart. Hello, good day, happy to see you. I, Crow T. Robot, have penned a little ditty in honor of the star of today's experiment. Kim Cattrall. Uh, it's called Oh Kim Cattrall by Crow T. Robot. <clears throat> Sung by Crow T. Robot. It's marked Allegro con Brio, Kershaw Listing 643. <clears throat> Kim Cattrall, Kim Cattrall, Kim, 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 Kim Cattrall. You were in Mannequin and that was a really good movie. Kim Cattrall, Kim Cattrall, Kim Cattrall, Kim Cattrall. Kim Cattrall. Kim Cadrell, Kim Cadrell, Kim Cadrell, Kim Cadrell, Kim Cadrell, Kim Kim, Kim Cadrell. You've never made a bad film. Oh, what the hell? Ring my bell. Let's go to the Dells. Our relationship will gel. I like your smell. You're really swell. I'm Geraldine Heston for Contel. I love you, Kim. I liked your dress at the Ace Awards. Cadrell! <clears throat> and now, a short scene from Mannequin by Crow T. Robot. Well, I didn't really write it. I wish I had. Uh, anyway, okay. Are, are you guys ready? Huh? Oh, ready. Okay. All right. Hit it. Switcher. Oh, Switcher. Joel, do the voice. You're ruining it for me. Oh. Okay. Uh, <sighs> Switcher, you are one sick puppy. After him, Rambo. Huh? Woof, woof. Uh, okay, now quick. Go get into your James Spader costume. Switcher, I am going to clean your clock. Ah. I kind of like Come that. Come on, play right. I'll never leave you. Oh, gypsy, not yet. Switcher, you are one sick puppy. Switcher! Having just Googled Kim's dress from the Ace Awards of that year, I concur with Crow's judgment. Here's the thing, though. Researching this chapter, I watched City Limits for the fifth time and suddenly felt that it was necessary to watch Mannequin for the first time. This urge was quickly squashed, and I went on to other episodes and never gave Mannequin a second thought. And then, a month or so later, I finished writing Chapter 7, essentially the mid-season finale of this particular chronicle. It was a warm evening, a school night, I had just taken my clonopin, which I ritually take every night at 7pm, and because I need to be gradually doped up like a rhino to sleep, my routine is, two hours after taking that pill, I take the rest of my meds and gradually knock myself unconscious until it's time for my day job in the morning. I had two hours to kill now, and I couldn't think of anything to do. After talking with my friend Catherine Coldiron on Facebook for a minute or two, I suddenly felt like watching Mannequin. I can't explain it. I just did. And if you want a really quality discussion on the subject, pause this podcast or, when it's over, head over to her blog, The Fictator, a link to which is in the episode description, and look up an entry called Better or Worse. She hits the nail right on the head. And when you're done with that article, check out the rest of the blog. She's tremendous. My take on the movie is a little different because, as it was a late evening, I was already more than a little buzzed and more than a little bored and desperate for any entertainment that I hadn't seen before. All my knowledge of the movie comes from the City Limits episode and a brief segment during I Love the 80s 3D. Yes, that is the only true trash that I love, at least from my perspective. With the clonopin in my system making me gradually drowsy, I was the perfect audience for this movie. Mannequin tells the story of an ancient Egyptian princess named Emmy, naturally played by Kim Cattrall, who asks the gods to bring her true love and is then ripped from existence. Andrew McCarthy plays Jonathan Switcher, daydreamer artist, a since-eradicated trope of the 1980s, keeping in line with the previous trope, of the magical, pretty, white Egyptian lady, who is obsessed with a mannequin he's constructed. After he saves Estelle Getty's department store owner from sudden death, he's rewarded with a job doing whatever the fuck in said store. He becomes friends with the super gay and absolutely endearing Hollywood Montrose, who plays like a dry run for the Titus Andromedon character on Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. 
Albert left me that bitch. He said my thighs are too fat. So my thighs look too fat to you. No. You didn't look. Hollywood, <laughs> I don't know about men's thighs. They, they look fine to me. They really, they really do. Thank you. Albert called me Cellulite City. Maybe he's right. Maybe I should have my hips lifted. <laughs> no, if you want to lose weight, just a diet. Oh, diets are no use. Uh, it's those jelly donuts. They call to me in the middle of the night. Hollywood, Hollywood, come and get me, Hollywood. I can't stay away from them. It's like you and women's dressing room. No, 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 that was a misunderstanding. Have any of your friends ever been vacuumed out? I heard those doctors in Beverly Hills, they just open you up and suck those fat cells out of there. He also quickly makes enemies with the store's vice president, which I didn't even know was a thing, who was played by the brilliant James Spader. Spader, who must have been given his salary in cocaine, delivers a performance that can best be described as broad and nowhere close to human behavior. If you haven't seen Spader in this movie, gesturing and posturing like Alan Shemper from the end of Wet Hot American Summer, just look it up on YouTube. It's insane. And this was the same year as his deadpan, terrifying turn as Robert Downey Jr.'s drug dealer in Less Than Zero, where he was at peak sociopath. Do you know what this young man just did? Uh, shoplifting? He saved my life, so his incompetence too hard nearly got me killed. If I were paranoid, I'd swear this was sabotage. Claire, it's not as if I was turning away Harvard graduates. I mean, if you know someone you feel is qualified enough to work here? Yes. Jonathan Switcher, let's show him our gratitude. Well, five dollars should do it, I think. No, no, I want you to give him a job. Take good care of him. Thank you. Well, uh, Switcher, what, what kind of work experience have you, have you had? Oh, I've had just about every job there is. Uh, briefly. <laughs> I'd like to do something creative. Maybe with, say, mannequins. Please. <laughs> I pride myself on being able to size up a job applicant and see just what kind of executive potential he has. I have just the job for you. Anyway, Andrew McCarthy, who is suitably charming as expected, is putting together a window display with his mannequin that he's obsessed with, when suddenly it comes to life as Kim Cattrall. What's the matter? Don't you like your new scarf? Not especially. <laughs> What a funny way to say hello. What the hell's going on? My name is Emma Hesmeray, but you can call me Emmy. <laughs> this is a joke, right? Some sort of Princeton Company initiation? Who hired you, Hollywood? Nobody hired me, Jonathan. You know who I am. No, no, this can't be happening. I know the sign. The electricity? My brain synapse, it was destroyed. <laughs> I felt so sorry for you last night. You looked so lost and lonely. Well, that's not you saw me. Well, no, you can't be her. When you were making me, didn't you feel a certain inspiration? Almost like your hands were being moved by a force not of this world. You made this body so that I could come to life. In anyone else's hands, Emmy the Mannequin would be the typical sexist manic pixie dream girl who only exists to advance the arc of the male lead. But Kim is just so... Ah, <sighs> Kim. She isn't slumming. She's giving her absolute best, and she's undeniably radiant. So radiant, in fact that I didn't even notice the troublesome nature of her role, not unlike Barbara Eden in I Dream of Jeannie, until the movie was long over. Emmy can only come to life for Andrew McCarthy, and she helps him become a sensation at the department store by co-designing window displays with him that make the store the hottest spot downtown, which kind of makes the movie an unauthorized live-action remake of Charlotte's Web if Wilbur and Charlotte boned. Yes, occasionally Andrew McCarthy and Emmy the Living Mannequin will flirt and have sex, and he'll wake up amongst strangers and a lifeless mannequin. It's best not to think about this aspect of the story. As for the rest of the plot, McCarthy manages to clumsily run afoul of the store's hammy security officer, who thinks that he's porking an ordinary, non-magical mannequin, which eventually leads to the scene that Joel and Servo attempted to act out in the episode. <laughs> Witcher, you are one sick puppy. No, this is how I get my inspiration. I create. Now, I can tell by looking at you, you're not the artistic type. You know, Mr. Richards told me to keep an eye on you, but uh, I think I'm going to handle things my own way. <laughs> you want to move your sweetheart? Ah, that one was for 
Rambo Then, spoilers, bad guys come to take the mannequin, McCarthy fights for the mannequin, she comes to life in front of other people, and they end the movie getting married in the store window display. The movie could not be any more 80s if it starred Nancy Reagan smoking crack with Mr. T and quoting lyrics from Hungry Like the Wolf. There are mandatory music montages, screen wipes with accompanying laser sounds, as well as no educational or artistic value of any kind, and a closing credit song by Starship. It's certainly an experience I'll never repeat, but I don't regret watching it. I can't really recommend it because, well, it's not good, but if you're like me and you only have 90 minutes until you're loopy and incoherent, you could do much worse things with your time, like watching Mannequin 2. That's just wrong. I will say that I enjoyed the scene that I played earlier with the security guard, only because I was imagining Tom Servo as the guard dog and laughed myself silly throughout. Other than that, again, just look up Spader's performance on YouTube. That should be sufficient. Back to City Limits. There's an interesting reaction to this episode's airing, and it's from none other than Miss Cattrall herself. In the episode guide, Kevin, and what is it with this guy and his good stories, by the way, shares some more. With this film, thus began Crow's Affaire de Coup with Kim Cattrall. Kim sent Trace some flowers, but we actually knew they were for Crow. Kim has never had any time for Trace. In fact, I remember one time when she was sharing a table with Crow at the bar at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. I overheard her say, Lose the blonde beanpole. He's a stunning bore. Oh, she'll deny it. But there's something about Crow's way that moved young Kim. The way the light catches his web, the reflection of the pale moon and his big green eyeballs. Now, because of the tongue-in-cheek nature of that story, I started to believe that the entire thing was a fabrication. Kim Cattrall star of screens both large and small, would never send flowers to a fictional robot. Then, I was browsing the MST3K wiki page one day, as I am wont to do, and I found a quote from Kim herself. Apparently, she appeared at the second official convention for the show, which took place in 1996, and had the following to say. I was in my hotel room and I was channel surfing. And what do I hear but my own name being sung by a small golden man? And it just went on like that. I yelled for my boyfriend to come in and see this. We were just in shock. A few minutes later, one of my lesser accomplishments came on. City limits. I called my publicity agent and asked him if Mystery Science Theater 3000 was a real show. He said yes. I called my florist and had an odd request. To send a bouquet of flowers to a Crow T robot. I know it's become popular to hate on Miss Cattrall for whatever reason, but any woman that sends flowers to Crow is alright in my book. The final FBI movie to be riffed on MST3K was called Being from Another Planet, which aired as the fifth experiment of the season. Similar to the generic retitling of Maroon to Space Travelers, this movie, about a murderous mummy on the loose, was renamed from its original title of Time Walker. Space and time. Two dimensions we dream of conquering. But perhaps they have already been conquered. Not by man but a form of intelligence far more evolved and far more powerful. A time walker. The discovery. I 
simply seal him alive in a corner touch tomb. The Awakening. This was in the coffin. The Search. Ow! It looks like some kind of wiring schematic. The Power. Nobody's that strong. Time Walker. Now, our time belongs to him. The story of a journey home. Time Walker. Nothing can stop him. Not even time. But where Space Travelers is just an incredibly literal way to describe the movie that it accompanies, being from another planet is actually a spoiler. Throughout the movie, we are led to believe that a mummy unearthed from King Tut's tomb is terrorizing college students, only to realize in the third act that the mummy is no mummy at all, but rather an alien that was buried in the tomb with the king after wreaking havoc on Tut and his posse. By addressing the twist in the title, it has the same effect of retitling the crying game something like Surprise Penis. But at least that new title has a pizzazz that being from another planet just doesn't provide. The FBI meddling doesn't stop there, though. Where some of the past episodes included credit sequences with footage from other movies, most notably Pod People and Cave Dwellers, this episode features credits made up of archival footage of Egyptian artifacts played over the first scene of the movie. We can only hear the dialogue and sound effects of the scene underneath the archival footage, which is inherently confusing and certainly doesn't do the movie any favors. There's a palpable feeling of contempt for the audience that Film Ventures International brazenly displays in all their productions. In this particular case, it feels like there was a checklist of things to do to ruin the movie-going experience, and every item was checked off with a passionate fury. However, I don't want to give the impression that Time Walker was anything but a lost cause before FBI got their greasy mitts on it. Shout Factory's DVD for this episode also features the uncut original version of the movie as a bonus feature, and I couldn't get past the first five minutes. So now I have Time Walker as part of my film collection. Thanks a bunch, Shout Factory. And also, thanks again for not suing me yet. The episode itself is another solid installment with some classic host segments. There's a great pointless discussion about the wide-ranging career of Billy Moomy while the bots are wrapped in toilet paper, and a sketch called The Haunted Boiler Room. In the tradition of haunted houses of old, Crow and Servo have laid out bowls of peeled grapes, jello slices, and cold spaghetti noodles across the bridge of the SOL and try to pass these bowls off as disturbing and gruesome body parts to a terrified and blindfolded Joel. Joel, okay. are you ready for terror? Yeah, ready. But remember, I don't scare very easily. <laughs> <laughs> Just ignore those bats brushing against Wait. your face. Ah, there aren't any bats brushing. Oh. oh, believe me, they're coming very close. <laughs> First, feel the eyeballs of all the weird kids from Mrs. Reedy's Spanish Club. <laughs> oh, ick, this is disgusting. Ah, that's so icky. Oh, we know, we know, we know. Now try the next bowl, the next bowl. <laughs> okay. Ah, little, 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 little. Yes, it's the guts of Mr. Satterbeck from Third Hour Driver's End. Yeah. But what follows is even more horrifying. Do you dare to go on? Sure. Another quarter, please. Oh, yep. oh nice All right, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The kicker is that the bots have only created this setup in order to extort quarters from Joel. Never mind that they're trapped in space and have absolutely no use for money. They're just little boys trying to pull one over on their dad. It's absolutely adorable. The name Ray Kellogg can be found on some pretty well-regarded films from 1949 to 1957. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Pick Up on South Street, The Seven Year Itch, House of Bamboo, The King and I, What Price Glory, and even The Day the Earth Stood Still. Kellogg worked on these films in the Department of Special Photographic Effects, which is why it's utterly perplexing that when he became a director two years later, his filmography now featured The Giant Gila Monster and The Killer Shrews. These two movies were both made in 1959 to serve as a double feature and also mark as a low point for special effects, both photographic and otherwise, not to mention a low point for filmmaking as an enterprise. After these directorial efforts, Kellogg became a second unit director, contributing to such films as Cleopatra, Batman the Movie, and Tora Tora Tora, in addition to being one of the three directors on the Green Berets, so it's clear that he was a reasonably talented man. 
but his work from 1959 is so terrible, so haphazard, and so incompetent that they gave the MST3K gang some of the best episodes of its entire run. The Giant Helo Monster aired as the second experiment of the fourth season, and if you've never seen the movie before and just judge it by the title alone, you would think that it's a pretty generic Atomic Age B-movie. You'd be wrong, and you'd be giving the movie far too much credit. This engine's still warm. Say, did you see the skid marks out here? They go at a direct right angle to the direction of travel. No digs in the macadam either. Somebody was hurt. There's blood all over this thing. What is this black menace that kills everything it sees and hears? No human mind could imagine the enormous destructive power of this maddened, killing thing. If you're young people in love, look out. If you're driving a lonely road, you're as good as dead. The titular Gila monster attacks the Hick residents of a small town for reasons that I'm sure even Ray Kellogg, who is credited with writing the quote-unquote original story, doesn't understand. And here's where the Atomic Age preconceptions about the plot are destroyed. This Gila monster isn't giant because of nuclear testing or anything interesting. He's just giant, and he doesn't really do much aside from knocking down a bridge that looks like it's made out of Lincoln Logs and disrupt an incredibly tame school dance. Why does he pick this town to menace? Is it related to his origin? No, not particularly. In fact, if you were to pick any backstory for the monster, no matter how mediocre, you would have put in more thought into the entire endeavor than Mr. Kellogg surely ever did. And to add insult to injury, the Gila monster isn't even a Gila monster. It's a Mexican beaded lizard. And that's the kind of attention to detail that makes this the masterwork that it is. But the real reason to watch this movie? Joel and the Bots' tendency to give the quote-unquote Gila monster a voice during his light rampaging. For instance, after the monster destroys the Lincoln Log Bridge and causes a toy train to derail and crash, we get to hear his interior monologue. Where's the dining car? <laughs> hey, there's meat on the inside. <laughs> Barbecue. Oh, I don't know where to begin. It all looks so good. <laughs> This clip is just the tip of the iceberg, but if I were to play every funny comment they assigned to the creature, this podcast would be even more exhausting than it already is. The only missed opportunity, at no point during the film, is the phrase, It's a living, ever used. Providing a voice for animals and creatures without the power of speech is always a winner in my book, and will come up many more times before this series is through. Moving on to the episode itself, this experiment features two of my favorite host segments, and they're both entirely character-based. The first is Servo on Cinema, where Tom, wearing tiny glasses despite not having eyes, and an adorable v-neck golf sweater, hosts his own pretentious look at the blocking techniques of Ray Kellogg until Joel and Crow derail the entire process. Well, hello. I'm so glad you could join me. I'm your host, Thomas Servo, and this is Servo on Cinema. This week, director Ray Kellogg. Ray Kellogg, uh, of course, was... Uh, excuse me, Tom. Uh, we've what? only got the one camera cam bot, okay? Oh, <clears throat> of course. Thank you. <clears throat> Ray Kellogg. Much like his good friend Orson Welles, Kellogg's career was short-circuited by his enormous ego and his difficulties in holding to a budget. For example, in today's film, The Gila Monster Effect, achieved with the use of a normal-sized Gila Monster and detailed sets filled with twigs and matchbox cars, and it was enormously expensive, and there was virtually no money left for blocking. But uh, Kellogg... Excuse being me. A... Don't, don't you think you should say a word to the audience about what blocking is, maybe? Hey, don't mind me. It's only my... Show. Well, like, good. I'm glad well, you said that. People of Earth, blocking is a technique used by directors to tell his actors where to stand or maybe what to do with their bodies. Hey, yeah, like in today's film. Uh, you'll excuse me, Tom. Sure, fine. Well, the director just had the actors put their legs up on everything. I was getting to that. You see, it's called the leg up position. Maybe the and leg up position is cheap, but for Pete's sake, they're unrelenting. They put their legs up on pipes, stop on it. benches, Joel, on Joel, edges, stop. on stop. Stop. You're really? Really? Pro, 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 pro. Pro. This is his thing, you know. So. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Joel. 
beat it, buddy. <clears throat> well, I thank you. Without further ado, a short film by Cambot, a tribute to the blocking techniques of director Ray Kellogg, known for the firmness of his leg up position. Suitcases on each other. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Cambot then shows a rapid montage of every scene involving an actor putting their leg up on some point of the set. And spoiler alert, there are many instances. When the montage is ended, Joel and Crow have not only taken over Servo's segment, they've pushed him out of the frame completely, and it doesn't go over well. In fact, it reminds me of many a stress breakdown that I've had over the years. Have you seen Point Break yet? Oh, no, but I understand oh, Swayze does on. just about all his own stunts. On, yep, 100% pure Tram. adrenaline. On, what about next to Ken? I love that the arrow shooting sequence. I didn't like ghosts too much. Jeez, that's what him. The second highlight comes during the letter reading epilogue, although this is more of an example of playing the long game. Well, here we go. We got the letters. People always seem to like that. Okay. This is from, get that on still story. This is from Shannon, Hi, age Shannon. four. Oh, nice it says, college. Shannon likes your show, and it reads uh, Gypsy, mm -hmm. Joel, Tom, and then Crow is Art. Art? <laughs> she thinks you're Art. Because of this one letter, when Mary Jo began playing Pearl Forrester in the sixth season, she almost always referred to Crow, with whom she had a relationship, by the name of Art, and never explained why. They also never explained how exactly Crow knew Forrester's mom, and it's one of the most esoteric things the show ever did, and they did it often. God bless them. Kellogg's other movie in the season, The Killer Shrews, aired as the seventh experiment. I would try to explain the plot of the movie, but after having seen the episode about four times, I still don't know what it is, and I'm pretty sure that's not my fault. Soricity. Looks like a small rat. Shrews as small as rats, perfect for scientific experiments, until they began to grow and grow into things. They must eat three times their own weight in food every 24 hours, or starve. There are two or three hundred giant shrews out there. Monsters weighing between 50 and 100 pounds. That's as big as a full-grown wolf. <laughs> Blood-curdling, horrifyingly poisonous monsters. With the livestock, the shoes got into the barn. The wildest of flesh eaters, threatening all mankind. All I can gleam is that it's about a supply boat captain and his racially insensitive caricature of a first mate that land on a remote island where scientists are experimenting on mutated shrews for reasons that are never entirely clear. Despite the island setting, a great deal of the movie is set in the living room of a house, and the shrews are simply average-sized dogs wearing Chewbacca Halloween costumes, only without the charm. The episode itself, like the giant Gila monster, offers plenty of great material to distract you from the turgid dirge that is the feature presentation. There's the prologue, where Joel decides that it's present time for the bots, but not everybody is pleased by what they get, and by everyone, I of course mean Crow. Hey everybody, it's present time! Wow. Wow. Okay, how, all right, that's good. Hi everybody, welcome to the Satellite of Love. I'm Joel Robinson, and I decided to give my bots a little pick-me-up today. Nah, Gypsy, you didn't get anything. He forgot he had a robot named Gypsy. Don't knock it off, you clown. You want to ruin present time by being naughty? Hey, Gypsy girl, look what I got you. The Little Mermaid Ariel bath time set. All right. Yeah, good job. Me next, 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 me Okay, 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 what'd you get me, huh? huh? Come on, come well, on, let me have it. <laughs> I saved oh, the best be for last, Crow. I decided to give you some dress slacks from JCPenney. Oh, cool. Oh, 
Oh yeah, come on, you'll get a lot of use out of them. You can use them for dressy or casual. And uh, well, I'm gonna have to get you a nice top too, maybe a pullover or something. Sure. You know, your birthday's coming up. Maybe I could get you some corrective shoes that match. Thank you for the pants. If you'll recall, I like to talk about the functionality of Crow's eyes a lot more than I probably should. And when he finds out that he's getting slacks, there's this look of devastation on his little robot face that only partially articulated eyes could provide. It reminds me of the look I probably had on my face when I was seven and thought I was getting a Super Nintendo for my birthday, but instead got a book on sharing instead. I must have been a really shitty kid. <laughs> Funny side note, if you're looking for that sound effect, it can be found by the name Man Cry, which sounds like a Pearl Jam side project. That name only works on YouTube, where the accompanying video is pretty awful. However, don't search for it on Pornhub. You will not like what you find, I assume. I haven't checked, but I'm pretty confident in my warning. There's also the Killer Shrews board game that Servo and Crow invent, which comes with a catchy theme song. One, two, one, two, three, four. Killer, Killer Shrew, Killer Shrew, don't know the difference between me and you. He comes out at night to give you a fry. Don't look now, but he's gonna take a bite. Killer Shrew. Killer Shrew, K-I-L-L-E-R Shrew, he's scary and tough, if that ain't enough, he's augmented with bath mats and stuff. Killer Shrew, Killer Shrew, he's, he's coming, coming to, to your town, town to, to get you down. Killer Shrew by Marks. Right. <laughs> that was Thanks, great. Yeah. Just like the movie itself, the board game prohibits you from doing anything. If you draw a card, you don't get a turn. If you get a chance to move your character one space, you find out that your character is actually glued to its position and you can't move. By the end of the segment, it's become clear that the board game is really just an art therapy excuse on Crow's part in order to process how dull the movie is without breaking down. But it fails since Crow does indeed break down. Dress slacks and killer shrews in the same experiment? That little gold guy has it pretty rough. I do have one gripe about the episode, however. Forrester expresses his admiration for a particular movie before sending the experiment, and for some reason, I had to look into it. Your movie for today's experiment makes even me sick, and I like Morgan Stewart's coming home. This did not go well. I remember almost nothing about it, and I watched it days ago. Normally, I will chalk that up to my increasingly fractured memory, but I only took four notes during the entire movie. They are, and I quote, Number one, prep school in the 80s. Bad way to start. Number two, directed by Alan Smithy. Can I stop now? Number three, Morgan Stewart is basically a nicer but less interesting chainsaw from summer school, complete with the same obsession over Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Number four, his parents are vain and neglectful people that only appreciate their son when he saves their ignorant asses from blackmail. Rich Republicans are the best. Do not watch Morgan Stewart's Coming Home. You could do something better with your 90 minutes. You could also do worse things, like commit a murder. That's definitely worse. But Morgan Stewart's Coming Home is a close fourth or fifth to that. Moving on. I know this will come as a complete surprise, but Ray Kellogg was not the only prolifically bad filmmaker to have two of his directorial efforts riff during this season. Enter returning champion and king of the unconvincing miniature, Bert I. Gordon. Gordon's season four contributions prove that he was more than just a miniature-based director. The Magic Sword and Tormented both provide ample evidence that, when doing something outside his comfort zone, he's still spectacularly mediocre. I am Sir George, possessor of the Magic Sword. By its powers, I will lead you on the seven great adventures, each one mightier than the other. <laughs> Together we will go where no man has ever gone, into the land of terror itself, where the Superman of evil is king. Let no man face my seven curses and reach the dragon's lair. The writers of MST3K are actually pretty fond of the magic sword, which aired as the 11th experiment of the season, but I beg to differ. Why? I've seen it more than three times from two different groups of riffers, it was, as it was also tackled by Riff Tracks in 2015, and only two things about the movie stick out as particularly memorable, and only retroactively. 
I can't say that it's terrible, but it definitely doesn't fit my criteria of good movies, and I like Prometheus. So maybe even my idea of a good movie doesn't necessarily line up with the traditional standards. So what about the movie do I like? First, one of the many kooky characters is a pale, bald set of conjoined twins that slightly resembles one of the more interesting background aliens in Thor Ragnarok. I understand that's a deep cut, but if you watch that movie, which I would consider significantly better than The Magic Sword, despite it not making any sense whatsoever, and you look in the background during alien crowd scenes during the second and third acts, you will see a character that is white with three heads accented by blue war paint. His name is apparently Haju, and he has no lines, and is, spoilers, killed in the end. When I first spotted this character, it me immediately reminded me of this movie. Secondly, Basil Rathbone's wardrobe resembles Dr. Orpheus from the Venture Brothers if he became a cult leader. Other than that, I got nothing. So what exactly is the Magic Sword about? Presumably a saber of some kind with special abilities. Maybe even magical abilities. I don't really care. But I really dig the episode itself. There's a lot to love about the host segments, especially when the focus is on Crow. We have established earlier in this chapter during the discussion on City Limits that Crow, much like myself, has quite the crush on Cam Cattrall. But during the Magic Sword, his amorous feelings are redirected at character actress Estelle Winwood. Born in 1883, Estelle Winwood was a British actress who starred in the theater and reluctantly became a character actress in film and television starting in 1931. If you had a television set in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, you definitely saw Miss Winwood at least once. She was on The Twilight Zone, The Man from Uncle, Batman, Bewitched, Love American Style, and Quincy. By the time The Magic Sword was produced in 1962, she was 79. By the time this episode aired, she had been dead for eight years. But that didn't seem to matter to Crow, though. Fellas, I've got something to say and there's only one way to do it, so give me center stage! Hey, be my guest, it's all Thank yours. As you guys, I'm sure, remember... I think it was maybe last December I fell pell-mell for Kim Cattrall <laughs> Yeah, we remember. Please don't remind us. <laughs> but now I'm over that. Well, that's good. We had a little spat. <laughs> In your dreams, buddy. I'm older, wiser, and I know that my true love is really named. Estelle. Winwood? She's swell. <laughs> she's cute. She's Rudy Toot Toot. I bet she smells like juicy fruit. Ugh. She can really play a witch. Ridiculous. She was even on Bewitched. And I'm bewildered and bothered. Oh, but Crow, <laughs> hold on a second. Hold on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> my body when maybe I'm a fuddy duddy but step back please and think about some stuff like what? I'm sure that she seems nice oh, yes. but I bet she's more than twice your age well. and with your love it might not matter but can she control her bladder? Sure. Oh, oh, come on. Come on. Okay, okay, but Joel, there's a whole other set of issues here. Servo interrupts Crow's tender ballad to list all the people more attractive than Estelle, which includes everyone from fictional puppy killer Cruella de Vil to real-life puppy killer Strom Thurmond. But Joel, being a supportive dad, sends Servo away to clip coupons and lets Crow finish his song. Hey. Crow, listen, don't worry about it, friend. Why don't you explain more about how you're feeling? Thank you. She's a vision, I got a new mission, somehow I got to meet her, so she's older, two, three, four, she's got a great motor, two, three, there's nothing that can beat her, two, she's Rudy too too. I bet and she I smells like juicy like fruit, she can You're really play a pal. witch. She was even on Bewitched. I'm bewildered, bewildered and bothered. In the official episode guide, Paul Chaplin dispels any notions that Crow's affection for Estelle truly eclipsed that of Miss Cattrall. 
thusly. Although Crow ostensibly rejects Kim Cattrall for Estelle Winwood in this show, it's not really true. His love for Kim has moved beyond the bounds of fiction. She responded to his original declaration by contacting Best Brains, and a long-distance relationship ensued. Most weekends for several years, Crow would fly out to L.A., and he and Kim would spend two or three days snuggling, ordering out, reading, and laughing. After finding out that the story of Kim sending Crow flowers was actually true, it makes me wonder, was this also true? The answer is obviously no, but I can dream. The episode also features a disturbingly funny cold open where Joel is obsessed with caricature drawing his bots in the nude and dedicates the final letter answering segment to a very sensitive discussion. Uh, you know, Joel, yes, Tom. I just gotta say that Bert A. Gordon did quite a pretty good job on that film, but one thing I'm confused about is the whole concept of the seven curses. I didn't know you could say curses on TV. Well, it's not that kind of curse. Uh, to give you an example, it's more like the curse uh, for people when they performed on Rick D's Into the Night Show. It's that kind of curse. <laughs> oh, got it. Yeah. Uh, you know, speaking of seven curses, despite what George Carlin says, there are seven naughty words you can't say on TV. Oh, sure, I know one, uh, like Hinder. A uh, booger. A uh, nimbus. Boobie. A dink. Mm -hmm. Caca. Boobie. Yeah. Uh, I think that's seven right uh, there. Wait that's... a minute. There's more than that. Uh, there's sure. underpants, uh, ding a ling. Uh -huh. uh, stinky butt, oh, dickweed. Right. Okay, 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 yep. okay, that's okay. plenty. Okay, that's. Uh, uh, Joel, uh, how about. Uh... Oh, I don't think you should really. Just thought I'd check. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, this episode's pretty great. The next Bird Eye Gordon movie to be featured on MST3K aired as the 14th experiment of the season. No one will ever love you more than I do. Can a man step away from his past into a future free from fear? Or must a dead past return, making of every living moment a time tortured, tormented? <laughs> Tormented, holding you spellbound for the she-ghost of Haunted Island. Tormented is about a man named Tom Stewart, played by Hollywood actor Richard Carlson, who is about to marry a rich, decent woman, and is blackmailed by his bitter, irrational ex-girlfriend named Vi. Vi wants to monopolize his life and ruin his pending nuptials. The two of them soon end up at an abandoned lighthouse, where Vi ends up on the wrong end of a broken railing and falls to her death. Because this is an attempt on Bird Eye Gordon's part to make a poor man's noir, Tom Stewart had the chance to save Vi, but didn't take it. So Vi's dead, and Tom Stewart goes about living his regularly scheduled life, when suddenly, Vi's disembodied ghost head starts appearing at random times, bellowing, Tom Stewart killed me! Tom Stewart killed me! Through a series of events that are inexplicable, Tom Stewart ends up in an endless cycle of blackmailing and revenge murdering until he ends up, in the film's conclusion, being stopped seconds before pushing a little girl to her death off the same cursed lighthouse. And that little girl? Played by Bert I. Gordon's own daughter, Flora. Needless to say, this film is an absolute pleasure and fun for the whole family. But as brutally unpleasant as this, as this movie is, the episode wrapped around it is easily one of the best. There's Dr. Forrester's Invention Exchange, The Drinking Jacket, which comes with its own built-in supply of the DTs, Joel and the Bots thinking of which pop singers they would like to push off a lighthouse, and even a segment where Crow and Servo decide to reenact the movie's only memorable moment by detaching their heads and proclaiming, Ooh, Joel Robinson killed us! Joel Robinson killed us! Hey, hey, I did. But the greatest part of this entire episode is the cold open, where Crow and Servo decide to take up residence in the ventilation duct directly over the bridge, and things go south very fast. Hey, all right, you two, I've had just about enough. It's time to come down. No, we're going to stay up here where you can't bother us. Mm, yeah. Oh, oh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Satellite of Love. I'm Joel Robinson. Oh, oh. Like, hello. Oh. Oh, it. It, it looks like Tom Servo and Crow T. Robot have set up housekeeping in that ventilation duct up there. Oh. Sorry, Joe. We love you. We just can't live with you. What, Servo? Use your words, Servo. Use your words. I have to go. Oh. Oh. Why didn't you think about that before we got up here? Oh. 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 Not the oh. I gotta go. I'm really scared. It's making me feel real funny, and I gotta go really fast. Oh! 
Hey, Crow. Hell no, I won't go. Hey, uh, Crow, uh, Tom and I are going to go over to Burger King and get us a shamrock shake. Them are at McDonald's. Hey, you guys, really neat floor. Oh, hey, no. Gypsy, no, you're too quick. Uh, Gypsy, no, no, you're too quick clowning around. Oh, oh. Oh, whoops. However, it's in the aftermath when Joel is clearing the bridge of Gypsy's tubing that makes this episode so great. Right before beginning his invention exchange, he actually scratches the tail end of the tubing, which is the equivalent of tickling Gypsy, making her laugh. It just reinforces the idea that the SOL is a family of Joel's own making and perfectly encapsulates his run as host of the show, completely warming my heart. And hopefully yours. And that's where we have to pause for today. Why? I want to keep this podcast as close to the hour mark as possible. We'll pick up right where we left off this time next week as we continue this chapter of the Coolness Chronicles on the history and legacy of MST3K. But the show's not over yet, folks. Sorry. Every hour of this fine podcast concludes with a segment called Random Recommendations. This week's recommendation comes from a Facebook user named Michael Flanagan. It's yet another film that I've owned for years but never watched in full. Lawrence Kasdan's directorial debut, 1981's Body Heat, produced during an era when the man could write a great script. So, when I was a kid, this was essentially a dirty movie. Anything remotely sexual, even PG-13, was extremely frowned upon in my household. So I had to secretly find movies like this on VHS back when Long's was still a drugstore and they rented videos, although I never saw Body Heat as an option. Instead, it was available in little clips on torrent sites. You could guess which particular clips, if you've ever seen the film, or even if you just read the title. But once I turned 17, I made the case to my parents that since I could legally purchase a ticket to any movie that I wanted, I deserved the password to the content blocker on our satellite package and the ability to purchase R-rated DVDs. I had actually been lobbying to make this change since my 16th birthday, but no dice. I had to wait. My case was considered and eventually granted, but for some reason, I still kept my distance from anything sex-related. I think the only film that I bought that qualified was Boogie Nights, but that film... There's some, definitely some nudity, and definitely lots of sex, but it's more about the big, funky, dysfunctional family and all their failures than it is about when they do each other. I finally bought Body Heat on Blu-ray about five years ago, but just kept it on the shelf, unopened. Perhaps it still held a stigma regarding its dirtiness. So when Mr. Flanagan recommended this, I made sure that the house was empty when I pressed play. Make no mistake, this movie's pretty hot. It stars Kathleen Turner circa 1981, which is enough of a positive review on its own. I noticed while I was writing this segment that my movie notes seemed to say Vintage Kathleen Turner, Jesus Christ, in 10 minute intervals. Also, Mickey Rourke puts in a supporting performance as perhaps the most sympathetic bomb maker in all of cinema, but really this whole movie belongs to Mrs. Turner. And William Hurt, also in the movie apparently. So is Ted Danson, but did I mention Kathleen Turner? I think I better collect my thoughts properly and wait to discuss this film in full on a future episode. So I'll leave you with one last impression. Kathleen Turner, 1981. God damn. Please send me your random recommendations on Twitter, Facebook, or email, and make sure to explain why you endorse it. I didn't ask that at first, and it actually made research more difficult. Before I conclude, I wanted to thank everyone involved in making MST3K for everything they've contributed to my life and culture as a whole. Double thanks for also writing the episode guide that I will quote frequently in this season of the pod. And I also want to thank Shout Factory for their excellent supplemental material that was invaluable to my research for this and every episode to follow on this subject. 
You can get the show on DVD at Amazon.com, but if you want to support the artists who made this wonderful show, many episodes are available on VOD on RiffTracks.com. I'm not affiliated with any of these organizations. I just work here. Thanks for listening. Please rate and review the show on iTunes or your chosen source. If you enjoy the program, share it with someone else. This is the best and largest endeavor I've seen to completion, and it would be nice to keep making the show until it just isn't fun anymore. Uh, Links to all subjects discussed on the pod can be found on our website at www.coolnesschronicles.com. There you can email your questions, comments, or random recommendations. You can also contact me on Twitter at CoolnessPodRyan, or like our Facebook page and watch for updates. Have suggestions for future seasons, as this series is not exclusively about MST3K, it's just a natural first topic, or things to discuss that are MST3K related, send them on over. If you want to advertise in this program, I'm a total sucker for a sponsor, so I'll pimp out any product you have. And Our next chapter will be posted soon. Until then, do what you love, don't be a dick, and as always, I engaged in intercourse with- I mean, goodbye, for now. Coolness Chronicles is written, produced, and edited by Ryan Rodriguez. Executive producers are Tracy Rodriguez and Luis Rodriguez. Original music by Bildsherm. Please visit bildsherm.bandcamp.com for more information.